Welcome to the Shield Healthcare webinar titled Troubleshooting Issues with Foley Intermittent and Male External Catheters. My name is Eric Yen. I'm the Director of Marketing for Shield Healthcare. Uh, listeners will be in a listen-only mode. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it in the chat box, uh, the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will answer questions towards the end of the presentation. Uh, attendees are eligible for one CE credit. Uh, you can download the handouts on the right-hand side of your screen for more information. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter is uh, Kelly Sparks. She is a graduate from MD Anderson ET program in 1995. Kelly earned her BSN from Cal, uh, Cal State Dominguez Hill and is currently employed at Mercy Folsom where she provides wound, ostomy, and cotton care for inpatients. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation to, over to Kelly. Kelly. Good morning. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk about this um, troubleshooting issues with Foley, intermittent and male external catheters. And I'm not, there we go. So as an overview, I just wanted to um, let you know that we're going to talk about the urinary catheters for patients with compromised bladder function that come with um, a number of challenges and risks. So no matter which type of urinary drainage device is used, each has its own problems and benefits. And we need to learn how to care for these people and um, minimize their risks. So the objectives today are that we will list two areas of risk for patients using a Foley catheter, identify two actions that can minimize these risks, and describe two steps important to in success of use of intermittent catheters. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the male external catheters as well. So the clinical practice guidelines are a, um, put on by the Wound, Ostomy, and Continence Nurses Society Clinical Practice Continence Subcommittee. And this is the best practice guidelines for um, clinicians. The purpose of this updated document is to provide the clinical resource for nurses and other healthcare providers based on current research guidelines and published expert opinion to facilitate the care and management of patients with urinary catheters. So at any one time in the United States, 15 to 25% of hospitalized patients, 5 to 10% of long-term care residents, and 11% of home care residents have indwelling urinary catheters. And in acute care hospitals, 21 to 63%, often there's no documentation of the need for a catheter. So it's not even documented why they're needing that. Both short and long-term use of uh, urinary catheters has been associated with a significant um, morbidity affecting the urethra, the bladder, the kidneys, and therefore catheter use requires careful decision making. There are different types of catheters. Um, usually there is a varied types of materials. They come in different sizes. Um, there are short-term catheters that come in, in different sizes, um, catheter sizes based on the patient's size, their presence of urethral uh, anomalies or any resistant that they have. And um, the trick is to use the smallest one possible to uh, decrease the chances of damage or um, discomfort for the patient. The catheter tips come in various different um, types and the normal is just a straight tip. Although there is a coude or a curved um, tip that can be used for males that have uh, difficulty with prostatic enlargement. The balloon, um, there's different sizes of balloon. Usually it's 5 and 10 cc's. 5 is most commonly used. The balloon must be inflated with uh, sterile water according to the manufacturer's instructions to um, ensure the uh, even circumferential uh, filling of the balloon, which is important because that can irritate the trigone of the, of the, the trigone muscle in the bladder, and that can cause irritation and spasm. Different drainage bags and systems and securement uh, devices are available. The drainage bags come in clear, soft, or uh, hard plastic. The urine drainage bags are designed for day and night use, and you can switch between 
day and night use, which a lot of patients like to do. The securement devices are um, used to stabilize the catheter so that it stabilizes the urethral or the suprapubic catheter, and that is to keep from having trauma to the urinary meatus or the urethra or the urinary stoma when you're uh, using it on a um, continent uh, cat for continents. The um, most of you have seen the results if you've been in nursing very long at all you've seen the results of having a catheter in place for a long period of time where the meatus actually will completely um, erode and clear down the penis and um, then also on women you can see the very enlarged urethra in women that keeps it um, that makes it difficult to keep a catheter in the next time so short and term um, Short in term, I'm sorry, the description and definition of a urinary catheter in dwelling is that it's inserted into the urethra, it goes right into the bladder, it allows for continuous or passive drainage of urine from the bladder. We have short term, which is 30 days or less, um, and long term catheterization, which is 30 days or more. There's different indications, many different indications for indwelling catheters. Um, severe retention, comfort measures, uh, non-healing, pressure ulcers, sometimes we have to do that in order to um, get them to heal and keep the urine off of the wounds. Uh, perioperative use, prolonged surgery, sometimes we have to leave them in um, after surgery. And then um, continuous bladder irrigation, if they have blood clots or any surgical procedures that they need to um, keep that flowing constantly. Also, measurement of urinary output in critically ill patients. You see that all the time. We have to have a catheter in for that. And for urodynamic testing, we use a catheter for that. Imaging studies as well. But there's inappropriate use of indwelling urinary catheters, which is very sad when people use them just for urinary incontinence or incontinence associated dermatitis. You don't want to see it for that. Prolonged use after surgery. You know, we try really hard to get the catheters out right as soon as we can after surgery so that we don't have um, problems in, you know, with their bladder afterwards. The contraindications continue with um, undiagnosed hematuria. Priapism, you don't want to use a catheter long term for that. Um, known or suspected cancer, urethral or, or untreated bladder cancer, we don't want to leave a catheter in for that as well. So the management of indwelling urinary catheters, the insertion, you know, I hate to go over the entire uh, routine of putting a catheter in because most of you have done that. So I'm going to skip over the cleaning the perineal area, etc. You know that. But one of the things is that we don't want to inflate that balloon ahead of time and check it because that can make a difference in how much it can hold. So it's very important to use the exact amount according to the manufacturer's guidelines because they've come up with those guidelines so that the balloon will not be tipped or it won't be too full causing um, irritation inside the patient's bladder. Securement is extremely important, again, for the fact that you can get traction on that catheter. That can cause irritation. It can cause necrosis. We don't want it to be moving around. And you know they've done some um, studies that show that, that securement is not <laughs> done right. Unfortunately, 18% of the catheters in this study that they did of 21 medical and surgical units found only eight or 18% of the catheters were secured. Seven of the eight were secured correctly. Um, six of the eight were secured with commercial adhesive devices. And um, that's available in 47% of medical uh, units and 92% of surgical units. The importance of this is so, it's just absolutely, um, it's, it's very damaging if you don't secure it correctly. So the devices that they have, there's adhesives, there's tapes, there's all different types of devices that you can use to secure it. 
and the um, we need to use them carefully because we can irritate the skin. So anybody who has some um, skin damage or potential for skin damage, we want to really make sure that we're not injuring their skin. You also want to make sure that you monitor the urethra daily and it needs to be looked at for irritation, erosion, or urine leakage. You know, I've heard people say, well, that patient can't have IAD because they have a catheter in. Well, those of you that have looked, you could tell that sometimes there's a little leakage from the catheter or even just perspiration and they can get IAD or um, moisture associated skin damage even though they have a catheter in. So positioning it, you want to make sure that you're not positioning it too tight on the thigh or, or, um, or the leg if it's a leg bag just to make sure that you're not causing any problems with circulation. You can secure it to the abdomen for men and women. It's perfectly okay as long as the tension on the catheter is minimal during rest and activity. So special considerations that we need to think about are, um, you know, the lack of estrogen in females can cause, during menopause, can cause some thinning of that tissue and that can cause this uh, atrophic urethritis which can be very painful when you insert a catheter. So you might want to put a liberal amount of the lubricant so that you're not injuring you know, that patient or causing any pain for them. Urethral obstruction, um, use the smallest bore that you can, the smallest size, a coude tip is very good for those guys that have um, that may have some obstruction due to their prostate and also again a generous amount of lubricant. And I, I yeah, iatrogenic trauma. Um, a lot of times there's there could be some trauma that happened before, either from repeated um, insertion of catheters or um, any type of uh, previous traction on the catheter, anything that could cause the trauma. You want to make sure that you're not causing more trauma. So be very careful of those people. Routine perineal hygiene, um, I'm just going to go over a little bit of that because there's no need for soap and water, I mean no need for anything special. Routine soap and water is very appropriate for meatal care. You don't need to use anything else other than that. So I'm going to tell you now that when, I, when you see CAUTI, C-A-U-T-I, catheter associated urinary tract infection is what that means. So I may say CAUTI instead of catheter associated urinary tract infection because it is a lot easier. So when I say CAUTI that's what that means. So just so that you know. And um, uncircumcised male, the area in the foreskin should be cleansed daily. And I mean pulled back, cleansed, and put back in place daily. And you know a lot of you have seen the results of not doing that. It's, it's not very clean at all. Routine drainage bag care. First of all, you know when you walk in the hospital and you see it sitting on the floor, that's one of my pet peeves is to walk around and see that and you know I automatically go in and pick it up. Um, there are standard precautions that you need to follow with that. Of course when emptying it you want to make sure that you're not con you know, contaminating yourself or anybody else. And um, placing it in a dependent position helps too, so that it's not, uh, so that it's draining well. Keeping the tubing above the level of the drainage bag is also helpful. And when you get kinks, that causes a huge problem. You know, some people move around quite a bit, and so taping the connections can be helpful if you have a patient who's confused or um, moves around a lot. We don't want to put any additives in these bags. They, are, they don't need any antiseptic or antimicrobial solutions. We don't want to do that. And on long-term care, you want to replace those um, drainage bags monthly. That's very important to do. And for the decontamination, you know, we used to do all kinds of different things. Um, but by and large, what they have found best is the acetic acid solution. And the bleach water works well too, but um, most people will use the acetic acid solution, one-third white vinegar to water, or one to three mixture. 
and that seems to work well. And you want to also let it air dry, completely air dry. There's just not enough evidence to support using, you know, a bunch of different chemicals in there. So, you know, this purple urinary bag syndrome, I've only seen it once or twice, and it's very interesting. Pretty much um, happens in chronically debilitated patients that have, they have a higher rate of this, and um, also people with severe constipation. And I was kind of like, you know, what does that have to do with it? And, uh, but when you think about it, the uh, tryptophan that is metabolized, it's metabolized in the intestine, and then it's later converted by the liver to a different um, product called indican. And the indican then goes on, well, the indican is red, and then indigo is blue. So by certain bacteria that produce the different, um, like sulfatase and, and phosphatase, in the presence of alkaline urine, that turns to purple or, or, you know, to a purple or blue color. It's very interesting, but there's no evidence that the discoloration itself is harmful. Um, most individuals are asymptomatic. So urine cultures and antibiotics are not considered necessary unless they are symptomatic. Frequency of catheter changes. The indwelling catheters or drainage bags um, need to be changed at routine fixed intervals not recommended. You do not have to change it at a routine interval. There's sufficient, insufficient evidence that says that you're going to risk any um, bacteria or cauti in patients for long term by doing these routine changes. So it's, it's not necessary to do. But you need to monitor the people um, that have them long term because they can get blockage. And the blockage can happen because of the pH changes, and they end up with um, with uh, blockages that you have to change it when they get blockage. So what you want to do is look at the pH, look at their at what's gone on in the past, and try to change it before they get any blockage. Intermittent catheterization. This is one of my favorite things. Um, many people. Many people do IC, and I'll use IC instead of intermittent catheterization. It is very safe. Um, it's um, using a short tube, a, a short flexible catheter that's inserted through the urethra into the bladder to drain the bladder. And a couple of things about this. I actually had a nurse friend who I worked with, and she would go into the bathroom and catheterize herself because she had um, neurogenic bladder and from a surgical procedure. So she um, would excuse herself and go to the bathroom just like everybody else and go in and catheterize herself and come back out. Um, also, my dad years ago told me about his uncle and it was really interesting because he said, and my dad doesn't know anything about intermittent catheterization, but he followed his uncle around the barn and he peeked, because his, his uncle used to go around the barn a lot, and he didn't understand why. And so he peeked around the barn, and he saw his uncle pull out this, this rolled up, he thought it was a wire, out of his back pocket. And he flipped it to open it up, and then he, you know, pulled out his penis and started putting it in his penis. Well, my dad was about five years old, and he's 85 now. So back then, this man had to do this around the back side of the barn. So, uh, and then when he was done, he pulled it out and he whipped it in the air to clean it out, rolled it back up and put it back in his pocket. So my dad told me about that and I was just intrigued that they did it that long ago, first of all, and second, that he didn't die of infection. That was amazing. So there's a lot of people that use IC. The indications would be for urinary incontinence in select cases only. Um, and it's an alternative to the longer term um, indwelling catheter. Chronic urinary retention is an alternative to an indwelling catheter for that too. So you can also use it to install medications into the bladder and collection of random samples if you have to have a really good sample but there are inappropriate uses as well. 
You wouldn't want to do it for hourly measurements of your output. Of course, you're going to have an indwelling catheter for that. It's not appropriate for people at end of life because it causes pain. So we're going to deal with the IAD and MASD instead, but it's a lot safer for the patient and less painful. So there are contraindications as well. And um, one of those is if they have a, a high intravesical pressure um, that, re that would require continuous drainage, you don't want to rely on IC for that. Um, there's people who just absolutely cannot do it because of spasticity, interfering with the catheterization, uh, limited dexterity, etc. So there are some contraindications for it. Now insertion uh, technique, it's performed again by inserting a short flexible catheter into the urethral opening. You advance it into the bladder to drain the urine. Um, the size of the catheter should be the smallest that you can get, the, the smallest that will work, that will pass easily into the bladder allowing adequate uh, drainage. So you want to make sure that you get that smallest one so you don't cause undue pain or any uh, problems with the patient. There is no single technique for doing it. It depends on the patient, it depends on their anatomy, it depends on their economic factors, all sorts of things. So there's no one way to do this. Insertion and management continued. We're going to look at, whoops, sorry about that, um, in the acute care setting, aseptic technique is used and the sterile product is used. Um, several guidelines are out there that say that there's, uh, that there's um, no differences whether you clean it a certain way, whether you're going to get an infection for doing it this way or that way. So the clean no-touch technique for IC reduces the microbial uh, contamination of the catheter, but it's not been proven superior to a sterile technique. So usually a moist towelette or non-irritating soap and water can be used to wash the hands and wash the urethra prior to and after and there's no proven benefit from any particular type of meatal care. Um, so the frequency that you're going to perform this every four to six hours um, or, I'm sorry, four to six times a day to empty the bladder. And again, that depends on the patient. If you look at how much you empty this, you know, one time, then you can kind of determine when you're going to need to empty the next time. You want to make sure that you empty the bladder to keep from um, hurting the kidneys. You don't want to get it overextended or have, you know, reflux. And also to prevent incontinence, reduce the risk of bacterial um, growth, etc. So, but there's there's many reasons to do it at regular intervals. If available, you can do a bladder ultrasound to make sure how much is in there, and then you know when you need to do it. So, that can be helpful. But not everybody has one at their disposal. The uh, types of catheters. There's many different types of catheters, but only the standard PVC is the kind that you can. Um, can be used after washing with soap and water. Um, you know, incidentally with, with IC, it's, it's pretty interesting. I used to teach people how to do it by touch. Now, I, I had a blind lady once that had to use intermittent catheterization, and I taught her how to do it by feel. And she had to clean, and she had to wash her hands, but she used her finger to find the meatus and was able to catheterize herself. So when people say, oh, I can't do that, you know, I like to tell them that even a blind lady could do it. And not only that, but also a lady who had a cast on her leg, that was almost harder than the blind lady <laughs> to teach her how to do it. It was pretty difficult. And, you know, the PVC catheters, it's pretty neat how they do it. I took care of a patient one time years ago who um, was a, um, quadriplegic patient and it was in the home and um, they literally cleansed it with soap and water, um, put it in, laid it out to dry, you know, the catheters were laid out to dry. Once they were dry, they put them in a little dry cup or in a plastic bag or anything and they just reused them over and over and over. And their, their, 
their thing was if it looks like it's time to change, then you change. But really, um, seven days is the, the longest that I think you should go with the same catheter. It's used widely, um, it's widely viewed as being associated with fewer complications than IUC. IUC has so many complications. So I like to see people using this, um, this type of catheterization. There are specific challenges for patients that perform IC, and again, the cost of the products, inadequate bathroom facilities, anatomical constraints, like I said, with it, but it can be false passages or bladder neck obstruction. There's all kinds of different um, challenges that these people might have. Prevention and management of, of um, catheter complications, CATI. CATI is huge. We're going to look at each one of these things, obstruction, bypass leak, catheter-related bladder discomfort, which is CRBD, and um, skin breakdown. So with CATI, or catheter-associated urinary tract infection, um, it refers to infections that patients get, usually if they were catheterized previously 48 hours before the onset of the infection, it's considered a CATI. There's no minimum period of time that the catheter has to be in place. They could have, they could have gotten a, a bacteria just from insertion method. Um, it could have been after it was in there for a while. You never can tell. The significance of that, though, is that 3 to 10 percent, the risk is 3 to 10 percent higher rate in women and older adults. Um, the majority of hospital-acquired infection UTIs are due to CATI. 40% in all healthcare um, settings. It's very, very, uh, it's a very um, common thing. CATI mortality rate is 14 to 19% and accounts for over 13,000 deaths. They are three times more likely to die from infections with CATI. So there's modifiable risks and there's non-modifiable risks. Um, some of the modifiable risks for CATI are uh, meatal contamination. Careful insertion is very important. Limited professional training of the individual inserting the catheter and the duration of the catheter. Increased number of hospital stays before detecting it and fecal incontinence and dis, uh, disconnection of the system. Those are the modifiable risks that we can change. And then there's the non-modifiable risk factors, such as somebody who's smoking in the last five years, antibiotics in three day, within three days, um, diabetes, history of malignancy. These are non-modifiable risk factors that, uh, that we have for CATI. The pathogenesis of, um, of CATI is that, yes, the microorganisms can get into the bladder, the bladder via the catheter in two different ways, intraluminal due to contamination during insertion, or again, the organisms that ascend up the bladder from the meatus, the rectum, or the vagina. So, you know, up to 20% of these patients are colonized immediately after catheter insertion. And that's as a result of poor insertion technique. Women are higher at risk for that, of course, because it's a little difficult to get to that meatus. Um, and the clinical presentation, these patients sometimes don't even show any symptoms at all, especially the elderly. Uh, Foul-smelling urine, cloudy urine are not diagnostic for CATI, which is kind of strange from what we're used to thinking. And um, catheterized patients should be thoroughly evalu evaluated for the source of infection before attributing it to the catheter. You know, sometimes it's just not the catheter, and we think it is. A typical presentation of CATI in older adults, like I said, sometimes they don't even know that they have an infection. They have a different afebrile response. It may be indicated by various alterations in temperature. It could be higher, could be lower. Um, so there's, there's nonspecific clinical manifestations. They could be hypotensive. They could have respiratory problems, weakness, anorexia. You just can't tell. But there are preventative strategies that we can do. 
Um, it is estimated that 17 to 69 percent of CATIs and 9,000 deaths due to CATI could be prevented. That's pretty sad. The most important strategies are avoid unnecessary use of the catheters and to remove them as soon as possible. Proper maintenance, of course, is very important and consider using plain bathing wipes instead of bath basins, etc. There's condom or intermittent catheterization may be appropriate for some people and um, really you don't want to use that in dwelling unless you really have to. Then there can be obstruction. Obstruction is a partial or complete uh, blockage of the catheter that prevents urine from flowing through the catheter. Causes can be external interference like a kink tube or a collection bag above the level of the bladder, constipation and, and fecal impaction. Enlarged prostate can really be a problem for these people and scrotal abscesses also can cause an obstruction to happen. Then there's internal obstruction such as stones or incrustation. More than 50% of patients with urinary catheters develop this incrustation and blockage. So there again, that's why you want to you look at how long they've had it. If they have the incrustations, back off a couple of days, whatever you need to do to catch it before they get that blockage. Because the blockage can be very, very detrimental to the kidneys and to the bladder. Biofilm is an accumulation of bacteria, host cells, and cellular uh, byproducts in a dense matrix, and it forms within one to two days of catheter insertion. What that does is it protects the bacteria, and the bacteria within the biofilm become really resistant to the antimicrobials due to the genetic alterations, and they're reported to be resistant to three or more drugs. So common organisms in biofilms um, such as protease um, species, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, Klebsiella, they have the ability to hydrolyze urea in the urine and form ammonia. And or they hydrolyze it to free ammonia. And that increases the pH. And then they end up getting crystalline build up and blockage and the biofilm leads to the obstruction because of the incrustation, restricted flow, formation of stones and things like that. So biofilm is very, very important to uh, decrease the problem with um, internal obstruction. So prevention, there is a lot of things we can do to prevent infection and prevent obstruction and that's to ensure that the unobstructed flow of urine is happening and that's going to prevent infection by cleaning it out and not letting germs just sit in there. Um, ensure adequate, uh, adequate uh, fluid intake, of course, to flush the system out. Ensure a, cons uh, a consistent fluid intake, not just a whole bunch of fluid now and then go a long time without putting more in. You want a constant flow. Bypass leakage, um, the causes of that can be an obstructed um, obstruction. Leakage of urine around the catheter is what it is, and that can be caused by many different things. One of the things is the blockage of the catheter lumen from the incrustation. So you want to look for that. Twisted catheter is first thing you want to look for because a lot of times that happens, the patient doesn't realize it, and then they're getting urine leaking around because of the high pressure in the in the bladder. So urethral damage from traumatic insertion or removal of the catheter can also cause leakage. The balloon inflation in the um, urethra, frequent insertions, long-term use. But you know the bladder spasms, it's, it's really interesting. Years ago I remember um, one of our urologists was saying when somebody had bladder spasms and I called them and said hey they're leaking around the catheter and I was a brand new nurse and my thought was, okay, fill it up a little bit more to block the opening. And in doing that, of course, that's where you really, really cause a lot of irritation to that trigone muscle and that causes it to spasm and then more urine leaks out. So chances are you've got too much in the balloon or it's filled to the uh, an inappropriate amount to where it causes it to hit against the trigone and that causes problems. So 
Bypass leakage can be because of too big a balloon. So prevention and um, treatment of that would be to downsize to a smaller size catheter, fill the balloon appropriately, and consider treatment with the anticholinergic medications. Establishing a bowel program is important as well. Uh, you want to prevent constipation because that can also cause that um, that bypass leakage to happen. Okay, catheter-related bladder discomfort, CRBD. The cause or the description of that is symptoms include sensation of suprapubic urethral pain, bladder burning and pain, the urge to void, and bladder spasms. Again, this can be experienced during short and long-term catheterization. The large balloon or partially filled balloon can cause a problem. If they're not um, if they're not secured right, that can cause a problem in tugging and pulling and the traction on the catheter. Bladder stones can be an issue with that. Um, and so definitely you want to prevent that from happening. Change to a smaller size catheter, uh, secure the catheter better, fill the balloon again according to manufacturer's instructions, and establish a bowel program. These things are, are the same for CRBD as they are for um, the leakage around the catheter. So just be sure and be aware of that. Now the skin breakdown can really be a problem with patients who are sensitive to catheter material and also the urine leakage. When you, like I said, when a catheter's in that doesn't mean they're not going to have leakage and that doesn't mean they're not going to get IAD or yeast infection or any other thing that happens with that moisture around the area. Positioning of the drainage tube or catheter straps on the skin, we need to watch for skin breakdown there and of course your yeast and fungal infection that can happen anytime. So prevention of that using hypoallergenic catheters helps. Cleansing and protecting the skin, cleanse, dry, protect. Barrier ointments are the best way that you can do that. Treat the yeast or fungal infections. Secure those catheters so that it's not riding on the neitis and causing pain and or leakage. Um, and basically good skin care is what we need to do to prevent problems with breakdown. So that ends the, por the portion of the presentation that um, is outlined in the WOCN Clinical Resource Guide. But I want to touch briefly on the external catheters because that can be an alternative for some men. Um, it's available in many different styles and sizes, less well known but certainly not uh, new. They've used external catheters for many, many years. Can be very challenging for some people, especially with dexterity problems. But there are different benefits to it. Um, first of all, you're avoiding all those risks that you can have from a, from a um, internally, you know, an indwelling catheter. You're looking at decreasing those risks all the way down. Daily changes, you can clean the penis, make sure that their skin is okay, less involved than I see for those people that can use it. And it can be combined with other options. Size does matter, so you want to fit that is that is the most important thing with these because if it doesn't fit, it's going to slip off. If it slips off, you're going to have a wet patient. If it's too tight, it's going to constrict and cause swelling and some skin damage. So you want to measure, and most of these companies, in fact, I think all of them that have this product, will include a measuring guide. And you want to measure the length and the diameter and get a fit that is perfect. The style is also important. There's adhesive strips, there's foam strips, um, there is uh, self-adhesive and some are very, very thin so they don't injure the skin as much. Um, so you want to look at all those different, um, different types that you can get. One of the most important things is to keep the skin, again, clean and dry. Can't say that enough. If you trim the hair around there, you'll have a much easier time getting that condom cap or the external catheter to go on and to stay on. Um, you want that good adhesive or that good contact with the adhesive. And you want to leave a small gap at the end. Um, it, first of all, creates pain if it's too tight up to the meatus. And also, that allows for a little bit of twisting without hurting uh, the patient. Drainage bags, they can have either leg bags, night bags. A lot of people like those leg bags, especially if they're ambulatory. Uh, you, can, you need to make sure and secure it very good so that they don't 
pull it off when they get up and walk away without their catheter bag, and also check for twisting. So taking it off, do not pull it off. That could hurt. What you want to do is roll it off gently. You can get in the shower to remove it. It helps. Um, but you want to always remove the leftover adhesive. Make sure that you, again, keep that skin clean, dry, and intact. Trimming the hair really helps in getting it off, you know, so that you're not pulling the hair. It can be very easy or it can be very difficult. Skin damage, again, good skin care is crucial in any of the things that we do. Mild soap and water, just dry thoroughly and inspect it daily. You want to make sure that that skin is in, intact. Compression damage can occur, again, if you get something that's too tight on there. Watch for smell, swelling, and you also could get a UTI. Um, they can occur with these. So retraction is a problem. Um, they do have um, shorter length, wider adhesive bands, external catheters attached to the end of the penis. They, are, they do have those available as well if you can't you know, get down to the full shaft of the penis. Um, decreased sensation can be a problem with spinal cord injuries. Confused, you want to consider the psychological uh, vulnerability of the patient. Remember to check that the fit is correct and also empty the bag when it's full. You don't want to let it be too full. It weights it down. So I want to give special thanks to the WOCN for their work in creating this, um, this guide to catheter care, which is um, which is a very important part of our whole uh, workload as WOCNs, the care and management of patients with urinary catheters, a clinical resource guide, and their gracious permission to use this valuable resource in this presentation. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Kelly. That was a great presentation. If you have a question for Kelly, please type it on the question box to the right-hand side of your screen. Um, again, if you miss any portion of this presentation, this, um, this is being recorded and will be posted on our community website, www.shieldhealthcare.com slash community. Um, it should be posted by this afternoon. Um, so um, we've got a Bunch of questions here for you, Kelly. Really, um, really great questions here. Um, would replacing the drainage bag in an indwelling urinary catheter or frequency of changing the catheter differ for patients with a spinal cord injury? You know, I don't, I don't know that it would actually make a difference um, what type of patient has it, um, unless that person is prone to getting incrustations, and then I would watch for that and change it. It's, it's pretty much the same for everybody as long as you watch the patient real well. Great, thank you, Kelly. Would you mind advancing to the next slide? Sure. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple questions on how to get your CE credit. Um, so you can download the attachments on the right-hand side of your screen or um, look for an email from uh, Capital Nursing in five to seven business days. If you don't see your email, please check, uh, check your spam folder. Um, okay, next question here. Um, uh, if the bladder is full, what is what is the limit amount of urine to drain at one time. And that depends on if that's a spinal cord injury patient or um, or not. Because a okay. spinal cord injury patient, you want to drain them very slowly. Um, if they're not a spinal cord injury patient, then I don't think it really matters there. I've drained 1,000 cc's out of somebody and nothing flat. But I like to go slow with it just so that they don't have a vasovagal reaction or anything that could happen. Um, spinal cord injury, though, I think you have to go a lot slower. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, what do you tell your coworkers that are convinced that intermittent catheters is worse for patients due to the frequency of cathing versus the indwelling? Oh, you know, the main thing is the infection. And what I tell them is, I would much rather have that catheter in and out 
done and over with than to have that catheter sitting in the bladder causing irritation, causing potential problems with the kidneys. Um, and, and again, it depends on the patient whether or not they can actually do IC. If they can't do it, then of course they're going to have to have an indwelling if they have that, you know, that issue. Um, but definitely it's, you know, they can look at the studies on it. There are studies that are done. And I would probably just have them look at the white papers on that. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, is there a difference in applying the external catheter on a patient who is circumcised versus not? Um, yes, with the circumcised patient, it's very simple. It just, you know, goes right on. With an uncircumcised, you want to make sure that you that you don't leave the meatus, or you don't leave the. Um, you want to make sure that the skin is back down over. You don't want to leave the foreskin up. You can put the foreskin back down. You can put it right over the foreskin, and that's perfectly fine. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, can you talk briefly about irrigation solutions and when to irrigate? You know, I think when to irrigate just depends on what's happening with the patient. If the patient is post-surgical and they've got um, clots coming out, of course, you're going to be irrigating. I, you know, Basically, you're going to be irrigating with irrigation, just regular irrigation solution, and cleaning that out so that they can drain easier. There's many different reasons for irrigation, though, and one of them that I can think of is just the um, the clotting that happens after surgery. Great. Thank you. What is your suggestion on people coming into the hospital with long-term catheters? How do you obtain a a specimen? Depends on how long that's been in. I, I personally like to change them when they first come in the hospital and um, during that time I would get a specimen. That's just me. I would like to change that old one out, put a new one, get a fresh spe specimen. I would not obtain a specimen from an old catheter that's been in for any length of time at all, so especially coming in from the outside, I would change it. Great. Thank you. Um, I apologize. We have so many questions here, but we ha only have time for a couple more. Um, which is best sterile, sterile water or sterile normal saline? That would be sterile water, I would imagine. Um, that's what we normally irrigate with, is just sterile water for irrigation. Right, thank you. Um, I am in a home health. How long should we get to see the patient from when the patient calls the office and reports a problem to when we go out and see the patient? Well, that's an odd question. I'm I, I would say right away if the patient's having a problem with their catheter draining, is that what they're meaning? I think so, yeah. Okay, well if the catheter is not, if the urine's not draining out of that bladder, they need to see them right away because that can cause reflux up into the kidneys. Um, it can cause a whole, a whole battery of problems for them. So definitely if it's not draining, I would say right away, get there and fix the situation. Either change it, probably that's what they would have to do is change it, or, or check it and see, maybe it's twisted. Of course, on the phone, you can have them troubleshoot a little bit, make sure it's not just twisted or, or something like that. But if they are not draining their bladder, you need to get there and fix it. Great. Thank you. Um, last question here. How common is the purple bag syndrome, and is there a treatment for it? You know, there is there is not a specific treatment for it other than if they need antibiotics, give them antibiotics and um, get that catheter out, just change the catheter. It's not very common. I've only seen it a couple of times, um, but definitely I'm sure that any nurse that's been a nurse for any length of time at all has seen that. Um, it is... Um, basically asymptomatic. Usually it's asymptomatic, but if they do have, if it is um, 
if they do have an infection, then they need to treat that. And it usually goes away right after they treat the infection. But I would, I would think about changing that, um, changing that out as soon as they're treated and get rid of the purple color so people don't freak out about it. Great, thank you. Actually, let's take one more question. This looks like a great question. Can you talk about the whitish yellow particles in urine with people with cowdy? You know, um, there's mucus. And, you know, I'm not sure if that's what they're talking about, but there is mucus in urine, especially when they ha have a urinary tract infection. And the mucus is there to help clear things up. The body just naturally makes the mucus in there. Um, if there's a lot of mucus, that can be an indication that there's, you know, getting a lot of infection. But basically, um, that's what it's from. It's the mucus. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar. Again, if you missed any portion of this webinar, you can um, check it out on our community site, www.shieldhealthcare.com slash community. We have a lot of great resources and troubleshooting tips um, on CAUDI and uh, exter uh, external and in intermittent catheters. So please check that out. I'd like to thank Kelly Sparks and Capital Nursing for this great presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody who attended. So thank you very much. We will see you in the new year. And happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. You too. Thank you.